We are a week away from December, and so we're going to take a, a little bit of a detour. We're going to get into all the, the good stuff of Christmas, and we're going to get into all of the excitement of the holiday season. Uh, but before we do, I, I really wanted to jump into this individual, a specific individual that I think uh, many of us overlook. Many of us overlook. Maybe we have some familiarity with them, but at the end of the day, we certainly don't put them at the time of Christmas. Christmas season, and yet when we look at the book of Luke, the book of Luke, this individual is definitely there. And so before I even go to my notes, I mean, you look at Luke 2. Luke 2 is the most popular passage for the Christmas season, right? And it talks about the birth of Christ. But Luke 2 follows Luke 1. And Luke 2 brings out the dynamic, the extent, the exciting birth of a man called John the Baptist. And that's our focus for this morning. We're going to be looking at John the Baptist. And I can't go through every aspect of his life. There was far too much. Um, but an overview for our time this morning, I, I think that there's so much that we miss. There's so much when we read these passages that we miss. And so in addition to bringing out John the Baptist this morning, I also want to issue out a challenge. A challenge to you. Because we're coming up to December. December is coming up very quick. And when it comes to the book of Luke, right, Pastor uh, Rick ministered out of the book of Luke last week. I'll be ministering primarily out of the book of Luke this morning. Luke only has 24 chapters. 24 chapters. And so my challenge to, to for us as Citrus Community Church as the congregation, right, my challenge is to read one chapter a day. One chapter a day for the month of December. There's 24 chapters in the book of Luke. You'll finish on December 24th. And I believe that in doing this, we will add a richness and a depth to this season like never before. There are so many details, like I said, that we just miss in the busyness of the holiday season. And so, as we go into our time this morning in Luke, I challenge you to join with me on December 1st, reading Luke 1, and then continuing on through Luke 24. To the resurrection. I believe that there's so much depth, it will add so much richness, and it will benefit you. It will bless you this holiday season. Looking at our time today, what do you know about John the Baptist? What do you know about John the Baptist? What information comes to your mind when I bring out this individual's name? I mean, do we recognize as the church today how much of a game changer John the Baptist was? The ministry of John the Baptist, I mean, it changed everything. It was incredibly significant in, in, the, in the beginnings of the early church. And so often in myself, like I, I focus a lot on Peter, and I focus a lot on Paul. And yet John's there from the very beginning. When I was a kid, <laughs> I, uh, I had this John the Baptist video tape. And uh, my mom tells stories of me at the park like running up on the rocks and saying, prepare the way for the Lord. And she's like, come on, Jeffrey, like there's no one here, like get off the rock. But it just, it was profoundly influential to me, the immediacy of his words. And we're gonna get into these words this morning. But the immediacy that the kingdom of God is coming, Jesus is coming, the king is coming, and you've gotta be ready. An immediacy that I, I don't always see in the church today. I don't always see people Wait a minute, Jesus is coming back? Yes, yes he is. And that was the entire mission of what John the Baptist did. Each and every day he would preach and he would say, the king is coming. Are you ready? The king is coming. Are you ready? And my prayer in our look today at John the Baptist, whether you're someone who grew up with the John the Baptist videotape like me, or whether the name, you know, maybe a little bit comes to mind, but not much. I pray that everybody would be encouraged. I pray that everyone would, would find a yet in our time this morning, things to glean from, things to learn from, um, especially because of the interconnectedness of John and Jesus. There were so many things that came out in my study of this passage that not only redefines what I think about John, but it also brings out some interesting things about the birth of Jesus that I didn't understand. And so looking at our time this morning, I've narrowed it down to five areas. Again, there's a lot of information about John in the scripture. 
But to keep us on track, I narrowed it down to five areas. And the first is biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy. What's interesting about biblical prophecy is that the, the subject could be a multi-sermon series. It's kind of almost a disservice for me to just put it as a point in my message this morning. And yet, make no mistake, biblical prophecy is a very important study when it comes to the scripture. Because there are many, many examples of things that were spoken in the Old Testament hundreds of years before that come to pass in the New. There are examples of things in the New Testament, right, the biblical prophecy, that have not come to pass, that we look forward to see, like the return of Jesus Christ. And when it comes to John the Baptist, the first instance that John the Baptist is brought out in the Scripture is 700 years before he's born. 700 years before John the Baptist is born, the prophet Isaiah writes about it, writes about what this guy is going to do. All right, so looking at our first passage this morning, Isaiah chapter 40, uh, we're looking at verses 1 through 3. And it says, and again, this is written 700 to 680 B.C., 700 years before the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, it says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is a series of prophetic verses which articulate that God is going to make things right for the people of Israel. We talk about it a lot. We talk about that there were challenges in the time, but things needed to be worked out. And this prophecy comes at a perfect time for those people. Things are difficult, all right? Situations are bleak. The displaced people, they're out of their homeland. And this passage is great news. Great news for the Jews that need to hear it. This is the type of message that brings hope. Hope. Verse 1. God brings comfort. If you are here this morning and you are struggling, even in our prayer time this morning, holidays can be a difficult time. May the Lord bring you comfort even now. God is with you. God brings comfort. Verse 2. Your hard work has been completed. Your debt has been paid. What a promise for these people. Who said, God, when is this struggle going to end? When is this struggle going to end? We were wrong, we are sorry, and the Lord is granting them that release. And verse 3, there is a voice in the wilderness that will proclaim that the Lord is coming. The prophecy continues, saying that this voice in the desert will see every valley be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged place is a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it. 700 years. 700 years it takes for that prophecy to take place. And I encourage you, if you're interested in the subject of biblical prophecy, uh, it doesn't take much. It takes a good study Bible. And you can find countless examples of things spoken by the prophets in the Old Testament that have come to fruition in the New Testament. There are so many examples of this. And though this one corresponds with John the Baptist, there are pages that you can find of prophecies brought out in the Old Testament that correspond with Jesus. And we'll talk about some of them as we get into December. Amen? So, with that said, this prophecy, spoken 700 years before John, is an exciting part. But it's not even the birth of, his, of, him, of him, right? I mean, he's not even born yet. And so moving from this concept of biblical prophecy this morning, our, our second point, if you will, is the miracle of his birth. Because John, what's interesting about John is that throughout his ministry, right, there's, there's not a lot of miracles. There's not a lot of signs. In fact, there's, there's really only two things that would accomplish that or go with that title throughout his entire ministry. And, and one of which is his birth. 
Because John, his birth is miraculous. Now, looking this morning at Luke chapter 1, John's parents were old. They were older. And they had kind of counted out the idea that they were going to have children. And just what is going to happen for them? And so their prayer was, you know, God, give us a child. But in reality, that prayer was never answered. It was never answered how they wanted it to be answered. And they had prayed for it. John's parents were upright. They were righteous people. All right? Elizabeth and, and Zechariah, they, they loved God. They served God. Zechariah was a priest in the temple and was completely blown away when in Luke 1, an angel of the Lord appears to him. Right? We're talking about a time, we, we are on the other side of the New Testament, right? We, we have been talking about the resurrection of Christ. We talk about the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about a time where people would sacrifice animals for forgiveness of sins. We're not talking about a time where people really felt that there was a personal relationship with God, that we weren't there yet. And yet an angel appears before him in the temple and says, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a son. And it blows him away. I'm going to have a son? He says, you're going to have a son, and not just any son. Your son is going to bring people back to God. Your son is going to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. That's exciting. That's exciting for someone like, like a minister, right? Like, hey, my son is going to bring people back to God? Like, yeah. And yet his response is not yeah. His response is how? How is this possible? How is this possible? How can we have a son? And he's very charitable, or a very charitable of his wife. He says here, how? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Which is a great way to put it, for sure. Proud of you, Zechariah, for sure. The angel that appeared to him is Gabriel. Gabriel appears to him, and he tells Zechariah, because of your unbelief, I'm going to close your mouth. Another great thing for this man. Now, my husband's mouth is closed. Because you did not believe, you're not going to be able to speak until the promise is fulfilled. He could not speak until the birth of his son. He leaves the temple, and, and everyone knows there's something. I get the impression that Zechariah talked a lot. Because when he came out, he wasn't talking. They were alarmed. Like, what's up with this guy? Like, why is he not talking? Right? And they knew something was up. They, they knew that he could do things with his hands, but he was not able to speak. He had seen something. Something had happened in that temple, but they didn't know what. Right? Even his wife. Like, what had happened? Like, what, what happened to you in the temple? I'm sure it was quite alarming for her when she began to have the signs of pregnancy, and he can't tell her, well, yeah, the angel told me this then, and it would be much easier if he could have done that. And yet he couldn't. He couldn't. I love to talk myself. <laughs> that part of the story always gets to me. Because the answer is right in front of him. But he can't say it. He can't say that the answer to their prayer is there. And so, as I said, Luke chapter 1, verses 57 through 66. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy. And they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. Amen. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the whole country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this, going, this child going to be? For the Lord's hand 
was with him. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. They were blown out. God had answered their prayer. Maybe it wasn't in the timing that they had expected. Maybe it wasn't exactly when they wanted it to happen. But God had answered their deepest prayer for a child. The birth of this baby is miraculous. And God had a plan from the beginning for John. John's birth starts things rolling in the book of Luke. And while time is a factor in going through every detail this morning, I wanted to give a, a couple of awesome facts that link Christ's birth with John the Baptist, things that many times we overlook when we're watching the Nativity story or when we're, we're looking at the story of Jesus. These are things that, that we often forget. All right, so here's one of them. The Virgin Mary and Elizabeth are related. They are related. And when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary to tell her that she is going to have Jesus, he already had told Elizabeth that she was going to have a baby. And if you look at the account in Luke, not only does Gabriel say, hey, you're going to have a baby, but Gabriel also says, and Elizabeth is going to as well. God had a plan that when Mary was going to have that baby, that she would have somebody right there with her. Right there with her. We often overlook that. You know, the thing that, that blew my mind in my study, right? And Luke 156 brings out that Mary visits Elizabeth while they are both pregnant. Three months of Mary's pregnancy. When Mary is pregnant with Jesus, three months of that is spent with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Three months of that pregnancy. And I know for myself, I often think, oh, they must have been on that journey for nine months. Nine months of travel all the way to Bethlehem. And that's not quite the case. Yeah, that journey was arduous and it was a long journey. But she had comfort from a relative for three months of that pregnancy with two miraculous pregnancies that were linked together. Amen. In our quest to get to the birth of Jesus, and that's kind of where I, my thought process was for our time this morning, we, we miss these things. These vital details of Scripture. Details that are often profound. And what stands out to me truly when it comes to the miracle of John's birth, all right, is that Mary giving birth to Jesus, Elizabeth giving birth to John, they didn't do it alone. They had each other. God had given each of them someone that could empathize with the incredible weight of what was happening at that point in time. To empathize what they were going through. Because they themselves were going through incredible births as well. They both had been visited by the angel Gabriel. They both had incredible pregnancy. And they both had children that were destined for big things. And that leads to our next point this morning. This John doesn't stay a baby. Jesus doesn't stay a baby. They both grow up and become men. Men. Yeah. There we go. Our next point is the beginnings of John's ministry. And John was a manly man. He was a manly man. John was covered in a camel's hair, a leather belt, uh, locusts, and wild honey was his food to eat, his choice of food, which makes me feel like the opposite of a manly man. Because I don't know if I've ever even touched camel's hair. Uh, but with that said, our passage is Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And uh, John is just a big place. Looking at this passage, in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. There's that verse again. That verse that was written 700 years before is brought back by Matthew in his wording, talking about John's ministry. Seeing biblical prophecy fulfilled right there in Matthew. This excites me. I'm sorry. I also had a matcha this morning. We're going to continue on. Uh, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in, all the, in the Jordan River. And this is a cool thing. 
Because as I said before, when we talk about John the Baptist, compared to other spiritual greats, the prophets in the Old Testament or the apostles in the New, John's not doing crazy miracles. John's not feeding thousands of people or seeing the blind healed. He's simply saying the kingdom of God is near. Jesus is coming. And I think so often we're so focused by signs we forget that, that we need to know that Jesus is coming back. We need to have solid doctrine. We need to believe, know what we believe, so that in a world that doesn't know, we can tell them the truth of God's word. Our, our foundation is not on signs. Signs are, are wonderful. Our foundation is found in the word of God. And so that's one of the things I love about John. All right, John, because even though there's no signs and even though there's no wonders, I'm not saying that we don't believe in those things, and we do pray for healing, amen? Um, but even though there wasn't examples of this in his, exam, in his story, all right, what there is is there is an example of someone who is steadfast, focused on the mission, the mission of seeing souls come to know the Lord, souls come to know God. He would preach and he would teach and he would baptize those who were willing to turn from the path and to follow God. He would preach truth, unafraid of what people would say. His boldness wasn't afraid of repercussions. He would speak the truth, and he would speak the truth in many different situations. I mean, ultimately leading to his downfall. Right? He would call out sin where he saw sin. When the religious leaders would come to him and he would hear his teaching and they would try to trip him up, he would call them out. He would call them brutal vipers. He would tell them to repent. He would tell them, bear fruit worthy of repentance. You are called to be better. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. His um, boldness eventually leads to his downfall. We'll get to that in just a few moments. But when it comes to John's ministry, ultimately he was game on preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. Each and every day he would speak, the king is coming, the king is coming. Be ready, the king is coming. Not only is the king coming, but he would also say that the king is going to change everything about the relationship between God and man, right? As I, I spoke about before, at that point they're just making sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. There's no ability to say, hey Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me for my sins. And John's saying not only is the king coming, but he's going to change everything about the way that we look at God and the relationship between God and mankind. And so people are listening to him. His focus is on the immediate. There's an urgency to his words. Prepare now, because we don't know if we have tomorrow. That's big. And church, we got to get that now. Because all the time, all the time I hear people, well, I'll follow God when I'm old. I'll follow God when I've got my house and everything is, is, is perfect for me. Then I'll follow God. Now's my time for fun. And, uh, and then I'll follow God later. We are not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. What we are promised is that when we humble ourselves and accept the gift of salvation, that God will forgive us. That's the promise. Don't wait another day. And I, I tell you, if you have not made that decision to follow Christ, to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believe me when I tell you this, do not wait another day. The best decision I ever made, the best decision I made ever, was letting go of my pride and following him. Following him. Don't wait till you're 40. Don't wait for that, whatever that end post is. Oh, then I'll follow God. No. We sat here not promised those end posts. We are not promised tomorrow. We are promised forgiveness from Jesus Christ. We accept that gift of forgiveness through his sacrifice on the cross. And so John's word and his message continues in Matthew 3. And he says, I baptize with water for repentance, but after me comes someone who is more powerful whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chain with unquenchable fire. 
Jesus is coming. I don't say that to scare anyone. It's a promise from his word. Jesus is coming back. He's coming. Are we ready? Are we ready? And it's a message that I would hear all the time growing up. It skipped the hands off me when I was a kid. Like, Jesus is coming. Are you ready right now? Like, can I get married first? Like, you know, can I have kids? Like, is he coming next week? Like, what? You know, and we don't know, right? We don't know when he's coming back, but we know he is. We know he is, and we gotta live vigilant. The truth is, while no one knows the hour of the day, his return is coming. We must be ready. And that was John's mission. Being vigilant. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And friends, we can't allow our friends and family to perish without the knowledge of salvation. That Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That no man comes to the Father except through him. An immediate takeaway from this passage, all right, from this section, the beginnings of his ministry, all right, immediate takeaway, boldly share your faith. Boldly share your faith. In a world that often does not want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Uh, they didn't want to hear John as well, and he still did. They didn't want to hear John as well, many people, and he still said the truth. Didn't throw him off his mission, and may we not be thrown off as well. Amen? So that's his ministry up to this point. I'm going to move to our next point, the baptism of Christ. Baptism of Christ. John's out there every day telling people this message. The king is coming. The king is coming. Until one faithful day when the king comes to him. And says, baptize me. Matthew 3, 13 through 17 reads, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And that's that second sign that I was talking about. No real wonders or miracles in John's ministry, with the exception of that birth, and this powerful moment when he baptized. If you've not been baptized yourself, I tell you, it's life-changing. It's life-changing. I remember vividly my experience of being baptized. I grew up up north, um, so I was baptized inside in a tub. Um, but here we do it at the river. And uh, if you have not been baptized, I encourage you to take that step. Does baptizing save you? No. No. But it's an outward sign that, hey, I'm putting to death in my past, and I'm coming up out of this water of new creation in Jesus Christ. And so I, I encourage you, we do it all the time. And when you hear that uh, sign up is ready for baptism, sign up. Sign up because it was life changing for me. And I guarantee it will be the same for you. But with that said, John has this honor. John has the honor of, of he baptizes all of these people, and then he has the opportunity, the honor to baptize Jesus himself. Jesus himself. And I picture this, man, it's going to be like a starstruck, right? I mean, you think about people that write books about celebrities or something, and then you get to meet them, and they're like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. that's all folks. You know, like, you're just, like, blown away. And then you have this guy that's talking about the king coming, the king coming, the king coming, the king coming. And it's like, look, uh, you, you do this to me. Like, I can't do this for you. I'm, I'm your fan. Like, what? And, and, and yet he has this incredible honor. This incredible honor. He gets the baptized. It's also a full circle moment for these two, right? Because these miraculous two, these stories have come together in this moment. Two incredible births, two lives set apart, two lives focused on bringing people closer to God. And as we move to our last point this morning, the conclusion to John's ministry. And I have two, two verses for that. Uh, Matthew 11, 11, John 10, 40 to 42. Um, John's ministry ends while Jesus is still doing his ministry. Many people don't realize that. They don't realize that, that, 
that Jesus outlives John. Jesus outlives John and his martyrdom. John's ultimate quest for speaking truth led to his incarceration and his martyrdom. John was, was killed for speaking truth. Like many of the disciples, like many of the apostles, like many of the early church, they were persecuted for living boldly for Jesus. And so with that said, I, I can't say, hey, live boldly for Jesus and challenges won't happen. We don't have that promise. But what we do have the promise of is live boldly for Jesus and Jesus is with you. And he is never going to leave you. And he's never going to forsake you. And he's never going to push you to the side. Yes, this world we have troubles, but are we trusting him? Yes. And he will bring us through. And what's crazy is what, again, another example of what men meant for evil. John's gone. John's ministry is gone. What they didn't realize is people were going to hear John's story and they were going to turn from their past and follow Jesus Christ. And his martyrdom, his, his death, led to countless souls coming to know Jesus. Yes. Countless souls. Man. It's crazy. Because Jesus and his disciples were informed in his ministry that, hey, John has been killed. John has been killed. And yet, believers in Christ, as Jesus is preaching, and one of these passages, I mean, it's phenomenal. Uh, as Jesus is preaching, they hear about what happened to John, and maybe they weren't receptive when John was saying it, but they were receptive when Jesus comes on the scene. Yes. In John chapter 40, uh, verses 42, Jesus goes back across the Jordan to where John had been baptizing in the early days. He stayed there, and many people had come to him. And they said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this guy, meaning Jesus, is true. And in that place, many people believed in Jesus. Even people that did not accept John's words at first came to know the Lord. I have one other scripture uh, that brings out what some meant for evil, the Lord meant for good, allowing John's story and mission to permeate the hearts of so many. That's Matthew 11, 11. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And then it says, yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Right? Because it's not about who's great. It's about that God is great. That God is great. John was not doing this for himself. John was doing this for the king. And we've got to be ready, church. Because yes, Jesus did come. The king did come. But the king's coming back. And we've got to be ready. And we've got to be vigilant. We've got to speak boldly and in love. And be the examples that he has called us to be. John's story is profound. And from the prophecies written hundreds of years before his birth, to the miraculous nature of his birth, to the ministry he lives out each and every day, to the opportunity to baptize Christ, and ultimately to his martyrdom for his faith. Through all of that, John is an example to emulate. Amen? Amen. John lived a life full of faith, evangelism, and truth. And may we as believers strive to be upright and proclaim truth as well. May we strive to point others to Jesus like John did. May we recognize the urgency of his message and apply it to our witnessing and our evangelism. While Jesus has already once come, the King is coming back. And we want everyone to come with us. We want everyone to join us in his glorious return. Amen? Amen. And so a little different, a little different from, from the holiday season, yet I think it was appropriate an appropriate message to get our hearts where they need to be when it comes to this season of giving. The reason for the season, right? That God gave his son. God gave his son. Let's bow our heads together. Almighty God, Lord, I am so thankful for the privilege to minister from your word this morning. And Lord, I thank you for the example of John the Baptist. I thank you that, Lord, a, a, a passage before Luke 2 where we talk about your son, we have this incredible example of a man like many of us. A man who, yeah, he had struggles and 
challenges for sure, and yet he didn't allow them to dispel him from the mission. That each and every day he was proclaiming the return of the king. The return of the king. And Father God, I thank you for this. I thank you for so many little bits of wisdom that we can glean from this and apply to our lives. I thank you for the encouraging passages from his birth, um, reminding us that while you gave Mary this incredible task, Father, you gave her someone to encourage her in that process, that she wasn't alone in that process. And I thank you for that. Lord, may these reminders speak to our hearts. And as we prepare for another holiday season in just a few weeks, Father, I pray that, Lord, that these words would penetrate us. And, and Lord, give us the reminder that we need to live boldly for you. Live boldly for you. You are coming back. And we want each and every person, each and every person, to join us at your table. Father God. Lord, I pray for those that have not made that decision to follow you. Father God, and I pray that they would not wait to, to come pray with myself, to come pray with one of our elders, to not wait another day to make the best decision that will determine their eternal destiny. That their destiny would be with you. I thank you for this message. I thank you for this time. Be with your church and pray until we see each other again. It's in the holy and mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.